uh, I'm also very delighted to have uh, Professor Vibe Baker, I pronounce right, okay, uh, with us um, in Istanbul, actually after uh, about 18 years now. Thank you very much, Vibe, for uh, accepting our invitation to have this SDS talk with us. Uh, although every SDS people knows Vibe, uh, but let me introduce him to uh, our audience who doesn't have SDS background. Uh, Vibe Baker is a professor of technology and society at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology in Trondheim and Professor Emeritus at Maastricht University in the ne Netherlands, educated as an engineer at Delft University. Then he studied philosophy of science at universities of Amsterdam and Groningen, and received his PhD uh, in the history and sociology of technology from Twente University. He played a central role in designing the teaching program of the uh, Netherlands Graduate School of uh, Science, Technology, and Modern Culture. He was the, one of the main actors in establishing the European MA program called European Society Science and Technology Studies. Uh, in short, we call it ESST. Uh, he was also the first international coordinator of this program that Istanbul Technical University was also participated in that program for six years. And I was happened to have be the coordinator of this program for four years, almost. Uh, this is actually how I met uh, Vibe. So we have about 20 years of friendship that I'm very proud of. So I have to tell uh, this. <laughs> uh, he's also the research master, cultures of si arts, Science and Technology of Maastricht University. Uh, we beheld a variety of administrative offices nationally and internationally. Internationally, he was the president of the Society for Social Studies of Science, known as FORES, and various roles he played in the Society for the History of Technology. These are, the, I think, the most important things I thought. His engagement between academic work and uh, the practices of science and technology becomes apparent in his work. For example, for the Health Council of Netherlands, the Rateno Institute, the uh, research council called Science for Global Development, and the Knowledge in Civil Society Forum in India. Uh, we may receive the John Desmond Bernal Prize in 2006. Uh, he became officer in the, that is the one I have difficult to pronounce, or the, you told it, or the one orange Nassau. That's something that the Queen does. But <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> well, it, it happened in uh, 2009, and he was awarded the Leonardo da Vinci Medal by the Society for the History of Technology in 2012. Well, of course, as you might guess, his publications are numerous. And uh, since he's one of the founding figures of SDS, we as SDS people had to read most of his work. <laughs> Especially about his uh, significant contribution to SDS theory called uh, social construction of technology, in short, Scott, we say it. I'm not going to mention all of his publications because we don't have enough time, really. So we better go on uh, with our main discussion topic. But uh, before we start discussing this main topic, uh, Vibe, I want to, as the main figure or main uh, founders of the uh, SDS, could you Please briefly explain us what is SDS as a discipline and what does SDS trying to do? Thank you very much for the introduction. And Hatshar told me that she was going to ask me this. Um, it reminds me of Einstein being asked what physics is. <laughs> 
and he thought very deep and then in the end he turned around and he pointed to a window in the fifth floor of the building and he said what is happening behind that window in that laboratory so what he basically said is go and look for yourself and the activity that they do in that laboratory that's STS now that's a bit cheap and uh, moreover I can't point to a window so I'll say a bit more STS stands for science technology and society so very briefly STS is the study of the relations between science technology and society it gets interesting when you then ask but how do they study that the 30 years ago when SCS started um, people like Hatcher and me were mostly coming from engineering uh, the natural sciences chemistry physics etc um, now there is a much larger uh, part of people coming from the social sciences, the humanities, history, sociology, anthropology, economy, and they all from those different perspectives study the relations between science, technology and society. So SCS for me is, is the, a prime example of a field that is in its core interdisciplinary. I my first salary was uh, as a philosopher, my chair was a sociology, a social sciences chair, but many friends say that deep down I'm still an engineer. And that sums up what the identity of SCS as a field too is. Let me add one, no, I want to add two things. One is, what are the questions? Now, there are, I think there are two big questions that all SCS research in one way or the other grapples with. One question is, how is it actually done? How, are sci how is scientific knowledge made? How are technical innovations created? So a very detailed anthropological study of the practices of what, happened behind, what happens behind that window. The second set of questions is questions about society. What effects do technology and science have on society? How does society shape the development of science and technology? Now, both sets of questions are at the core of STS. Not every individual will do both. Um, personally, I've been switching between both, but some people mostly stay in the anthropology side others stay in the big sociological economics side but as a field it covers both now my final comment i think that here in turkey like in the netherlands um, and in countries like the united states you will find most sts people um, in universities that's where they study that's where they teach i it was quite illuminating and an enriching experience for me to see that in India quite a lot of what I would call SDS people they didn't call themselves like that they, they now start to call themselves a little bit like that but happened in NGOs so people not working in universities but working as activists either aligning with farmers or with workers or with craftspeople, but in that work trying to better understand the relations between science and technology and society and thus trying to, well, contribute to society, shape society. So it's interesting to, to realize, at least for me as a Dutchman coming from a university, that, an ex an, an, that activities like SDS are not confined to the university. Well, we are guests of IST Istanbul lab here, which is not a university department. So that's an example, I would say. Thank you very much, Lise. Uh, Lise, in your work, you mainly argue that uh, we live in a technological culture. Uh, so society cannot really be understood without taking into account the role of science and technology. Uh, the Scott approach that you have developed uh, offers a very good uh, conceptual framework for uh, understanding 
many dimensions or uh, elements which uh, technological culture consists of. Uh, in 1980, a very important SDS researcher, Winner, asked the question, do arch architects have politics? And Scott approached the answer, you answered, yes, technology is socially and politically constructed, and technological culture consists of various socio-technical elements. Therefore, how to democratize technological culture is really very, very important this year, I think. Uh, especially for countries like Turkey, where democracy is desperately needed. So we are very excited to hear about uh, say about democratization of technological culture. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And and I'll stand here so that I can actually see everyone. And I'm not trained as a, as a, as a pop mu musician, but let's hope that the sound will, will work out. Um, I want to argue three points. Um, uh, sorry, I want to do it in three steps, but I want to make one big point. I want to argue that we live in technological cultures. That's the first step. Um, and that these cultures need more democratization. That is the one and only message that I'm going to try to argue. But I'll do it in three steps um, by telling three stories. I will tell a story about Indian handloom weaving, a story about Indian farmers, and a story about Dutch policy making. And those three stories, I hope, will help me to rethink technology, to rethink science, and to rethink democracy. And by the end, I hope that I have shown you how rethinking those three, rethinking the technology and rethinking the science and rethinking the democracy, opens up new possibilities for democratization of our societies. <coughs> our societies then, what I will argue, to be seen as technological cultures. So uh, the first story is actually two stories. I, the, the first chapter is about technology and innovation, but I will use two stories. I will first tell you a story about the history of the bicycle. I will do that to introduce that Scott that Hatcher already mentioned, the social construction of technology. And then secondly, I will turn to handloom weaving in India um, and make a broader argument about innovation. Innovation not only in technology, but also in crafts and also in the arts, in the fine arts. But first, the um, bicycle. Does this machine work? That's the question that I want to answer. Um, and it's not, I mean, why am I asking that? I'm asking it because it's a bit of a it's a bit of a strange thing in history. 200 years before this machine appeared, and this machine appeared 100 years ago in Britain, 200 years before, Leonardo da Vinci had already sketched the bicycle that we now use. Two low wheels, chain drive on the rear wheel. It was wood, the thing was made of wood, but for the rest it was just the bicycle that we had. So why then, 200 years later, suddenly make a thing like this, which seems pretty scary. To be honest, I, I bicycled on it once, um, and, and I was completely bruised with lots of blue, blue spots on my body because I fell so often from that thing. So the question, it's not obvious that it works. So I am tr going to try to understand whether it works, but then not by, on by say, taking it apart as an engineer, not, 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 not sort of screwing it apart and understanding the nuts and bolts and the technology, but as a kind of a sociologist historian by trying to show you, trying to understand how people around that bicycle saw it, how they used it or not used it. The first step is which people then? 
who should be the relevant social groups, who should be the groups that I have to look at if I want to understand that particular technology. I'm now using the bicycle as an example, but I would do this trick for any other technology that I want to understand. Here is the bicycle. And I'm going to argue that women are important to understand this bicycle. But that is not self-evident. We are talking about Victorian times in Britain. Those were days where the women were not supposed to be out on the street in any sort of ostentatious way. Um, they, if, if out, they were supposed to be chaperoned by men. So yes, they were, they were allowed to bicycle, but then sitting low on a tricycle, so between the two wheels, and the man behind them would do the bicycling. That was allowed. But sitting on a bicycle, uh, on a high-wheeled bicycle, with all that wind under your skirts and the man looking at you, that wasn't quite what Victorian morals expected of women. But they are relevant to understand the bicycle, and I need this picture to prove that to you. This is a picture of a bicycle, and I'm, I don't want to pull this out of the wall, but can I still walk? Okay, good. Um, this is, the, this is the, the bicycle that you have to look at. The left one is the regular, normal, high-wheeled, ordinary bicycle that I, s that I showed you in the previous picture, and that's the one that everyone used, that men used, and that, that, that women would have a problem with because of their skirts, and they would have one leg on both sides, and, and all the moral problems of, of, being, of uh, being not, not behaving properly. Now, there was one engineer, uh, Stanley, who figured that if Queen Victoria herself is allowed to sit on a horse, but with, one, with two legs on one side of the horse and, and re, uh, re, uh, uh, riding like that, well then, surely women are also allowed to sit on the bicycle like that, two legs on one side. And that is what he in constructed. So there is a very clever mechanism of, uh, of levers on the left side of that big wheel. It, you, you can see that the, the big wheel and the small wheel are out of line so that her gravity point is between the two wheels. Uh, and, uh, and, and her, her legs are on one side. So he expected no moral problems. The thing actually, actually exists. I've seen it in the British Museum in London. Um, but it was an economic failure. And uh, to be honest, I don't know what your reaction is when you see this, but just try to imagine what would happen if, if she would fall that way. I mean, if we, if we now fall on the bicycle, then, then we just scratch, stretch a leg, and, and most of the time we kind of manage. What can she do? I mean, she can, yeah, she can hold out an arm, but by the time that arm reaches the ground, she's going so fast that, that she'll break her arm. So it's, it's a very nerving thing that, that, I mean, falling this way, that's no problem. She, she can jump off, but falling that way is quite scary. So the picture is used to prove that someone like Starley, a very w accomplished engineer, recognized that women wanted to bicycle, and he tried to find the technical innovation to allow them to bicycle. For the rest, it was a big failure, but that's not the point of the story. And actually, this, is, this, this whole picture is a fake. It's a set-up picture. If you look well, you see an iron thread here, and one on the other, and there is, there is a cloth at the background with painted bushes and hills. So this is in a studio. You could pay the photographer, climb the bicycle, the photo was made, and you could send the picture home at, uh, having, having this holiday. So the, the picture is a fake, but the bicycle isn't, and that's my point. The bicycle was made, and I take that as a proof that women were relevant for uh, understanding the, 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 the meaning of, of a bicycle. Okay, now then, what is the meaning? that these women attach to the bicycle. I use this picture to illustrate this, although these are men who sit on the bike, and these, this is, these are the normal bikes, not, not that, 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 that women's bicycle. Uh, but you do, see the, you do see the risk here. 
uh, in this case, um, uh, there is a whole flock of sheep uh, that, 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 that he falls over. But I assure you, you didn't need, you didn't need sheep. Uh, uh, just a stone was enough to make you fall because your gravity point was so close to that, to that big wheel that only a little un, uh, sort of unevenness in the road would be enough to catapult you forward. And then, um, well, if I can give you a tip. If ever you are on a bicycle like this and you go downhill, forget the brakes. These, they, they had brakes, but they didn't work. So what do you do? You do what this man does. I have to be careful with my mic. Throw your legs over the handlebar. Uh, they call that coaching. Uh, because if now he falls, at least he is catapulted forward and there is a chance that he will land on his feet. This man didn't do that, so his, his thighs were caught behind the handlebar and he just dumps with, well, in this case, he falls quite softly on the wool of the sheep, but most of the time you, he would fall with his face in the mud and the stones. So it is a very dangerous thing, this bicycle. And that is, and that is also what the main me meaning for these women was. It's a dangerous machine. It really doesn't work very well if this is your regular practice of bicycling. And as a footnote, I'm, I'm not sure that these people knew that, it's silly because Leonardo da Vinci had the, had the regular bicycle that we now use already invented 200 years earlier. So this is the bicycle that you see if you look through the eyes of women or elderly men like me who try to bicycle and then fall off and get bruised all over their body. Let's now take another group. The young man of means and nerve, which is a nice English expression. Young man of means, means that they were of sort of higher upper middle class in Britain, of means and nerve, nerve meaning that they were uh, athletic, uh, risk taking, the ones who actually used that bicycle. Let's look through their eyes what the bicycle was and then you see this bicycle. What I call the macho bicycle. The, the steel and the wood and the rubber is exactly the same. But if you look through the eyes of these young men, you don't see a dangerous machine. No, you see a, mean, a, a, a machine that is a bit risky, but yes, they wanted to be risky, otherwise the lady, the, their lady friends were not impressed when they, when they bicycled around on that, on that bike. There is a whole culture around riding these bicycles that, that in a way celebrates those risks. Uh, for example, uh, there is the, the, the so-called imperial cropper, that's an English term, but it also in German uh, it was the kaiserliche Kopfroll, which meant that if you fell, you were supposed to make a somersault and elegantly stand by the side of, your, of the road while the, the, the bicycle disappeared in the ditches. I found an advertisement of the, uh, of the firm Humber. Humber later continued to make cars, but then they were making bicycles. And that little advertisement, probably fake, but that's not the point, of Humber reproduced a letter from a customer. And the customer said, uh, wrote, Dear Mr. Humber, I bought a bicycle from you one and a half year ago, and I'm very satisfied. I made 69 falls, and there is no scratch on the lacquer. So he was not complaining about the falling. No, that was the whole point. But he was complimenting uh, Mr. Humber, or the factory, that the paint was so strong and sturdy that it still shone after so many falls. So there is a whole culture of risk-taking around this bicycle. Basically, I would argue, this is a different bicycle than the previous one. This is the macho bicycle, and the previous one is the unsafe bicycle, and they are different. They are radically different. Now, to sum up, 
And this is a summary of the social construction of technology. If you want to analyze a technology like the ordinary high-wheeled bicycle, first identify the relevant social groups. I've only mentioned two now, but typically there will be many more. For example, women and young men. Then describe the technology through the eyes of those relevant social groups, through the eyes of the women. You see the unsafe bicycle through the eyes of the young men. You see the macho bicycle. And what have I done, done as a researcher? I have demonstrated the interpreted the flexibility of that one technology. I have argued to you, I, I hope I convinced you, that there is not one bicycle, but there are two bicycles. And having said that, if you, if you, if you, if you go with me, if you accept this, then there is a big question. Then the question is, but what then is the next step? How then does the bicycle develop? What then is the social construction of the bicycle? Because evidently, it's not a matter of engineering. Both things are, in engineering terms, identical. But they are different. So the next step is a step of social processes, of social construction. I'm not going to tell that story. We all know what happened. This is the one that won. And when that became the dominant meaning, then solutions were sought to make it safer. The front wheel became lower. Better brakes were added, uh, etc., etc. And that's, in the end, the bicycle that we now have. But that was a social process where, well, at some point, the social and the technical started to, to, started to work together again. But it was a social process because, in engineering terms, both are identical. I now applied the social construction of technology to a single machine, the bicycle. I want now to make a next step, and that's the step towards technological culture. Um, I want to show that, that if you do a case study like this well enough, if you zoom in and if you ask the right questions, you see basically the whole world. And I'll give you the example of how bicycling can give you a view of what at that moment in Britain was happening in terms of women's emancipation. It was the time of the suffragette movement, the, the, the political pressure to open up uh, the election process also for women, so the plea for general elections. Um, and uh, how do I do that? I like this. I'm, I'm going to use the bicycle study to, to give you a view of that bigger societal development. I'm going to show you two cartoons from those days. This is the first cartoon, and this is the original caption. Um, you see to the left, you see a spinning wheel, a, a Victorian woman very in a, dressed in a very standard classic uh, dress, sitting behind her spinning wheel, um, the wheel of the past. And here is the wheel of the future. You see by now already the low wheeled, two low wheel uh, bicycle. And, and you see a woman, oh horror, even dressed in trousers, in trousers, but with all the iconic iconography of, of power and, and taking the initiative in her own hands, looking back to the past that she leaves, white against the dark background, and taking off into the future. My point is that this cartoonist wasn't interested in bicycling. He was interested in women emancipation. He wanted to make a point about women's liberation. But he chose the bicycle to make that point. So my, my, the, the, my argument is that if you do that case study well enough, even something as trivial as a bicycle, you, you see this much broader set of societal questions. I have one more cartoon for you. Um, th this is my caption, but I think this is the only sensible thing that at that moment can happen in that household. She is taking off again with a bicycle. The man is doing the laundry, uh, doing the laundry in a, in a big bowl of water. And, and the two children are playing down there at the bottom. And she takes off and, uh, and reminds him to have dinner ready at, uh, at, at 8 o'clock in the evening. 
again, uh, it's a cartoon, but it's not a cartoon about the bicycle or about the laundry uh, or about the children uh, toys. It is a cartoon about women emancipation, but using the bicycle as a kind of an as a kind of an icon. So, what I try to show is that. I started with studying the culture of technology, the culture of the bicycle, narrowly focused on that artifact, that machine. But the analysis can then be broadened to also study technological culture at large. So although I started with a single artifact, I ended with asking questions about women's emancipation in Victorian times in Britain. So, my argument, we live in a technological culture, has two implications, has two messages. The left message is my message to the social scientists of this world. And the argument is, don't think that you can understand our current societies if you do not also understand the role that science and technology play in that society. And the mirror image message to the engineers is, don't think that you can make a working technological system if you not also think about how it is fitting into society. So the statement, we live in a technological culture, is a statement about, well, the, 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 the setup of our societies and is a plea for interdisciplinary research, collaboration between engineers, scientists on the one hand, and the social scientists, anthropologists, sociologists on the other hand. Now, if that, if you accept this second point, then the implication is that we need to experiment with democracy. We can't just continue and, 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 and assume that what worked 100 years ago will continue to work. First of all, those technological cultures that we now live in basically all have constitutions from the 19th century. They're all constitutions are based basically on, on the political philosophy of Montesquieu, of course rewritten in their own language in every country except Britain. I now understand that Britain doesn't have a constitution at all, but I never knew that only surfaced now in the context of these Brexit uh, trouble. But most countries like Turkey and the Netherlands and the United States, they have constitutions, but they're all ultimately based on the 19th century view of the world. And, and my argument is that's not enough anymore. We live in technological cultures and that asks for a rethinking of also democracy and science and technology as, as I'm arguing tonight. A second argument, a different one, is a changing role of the state and two very contradictory developments um, have been are, are, are clear in, in most countries in the world, uh, definitely also in, 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 in Turkey, a little bit in, in the Netherlands. I've also seen it in, uh, in India. On the one hand, there is a retreat of the state, a neoliberal retreat of the state. We'll leave things to the market. We leave things to economy, the market, the companies, and, and that will take care of it. That's a retreat of the state. At the same time, a very contradictory move, there is an increasing sort of urge to control society uh, by the state. And that may, that, may, that may result in censorship, that may result in uh, tailoring the, the press. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely not talking about Turkey. This is a general diagnosis in many countries happening. And these are very clearly contradictory movements. The state is on retreat economic, economically, but the state is increasing its grip on society on other fields. Now, that, that clearly asks for rethinking the role of the state. And I'm asking, I'm not going to answer that question, but I'm asking how can we rethink the role of that state so that um, there is a more democratic procedure in our countries and also so that science and technology can be more democratically studied. Now, this was the first 
story in this chapter about technology. This was, I used the bicycle story to make this sort of larger point. I will now turn to hand plume weaving in India. Why would a Dutch STS professor be interested in handloom at all? Well, it is the second largest livelihood in rural India after farming. And this would probably apply to many other countries in the global south. So if you want to seriously think about poverty alleviation, about um, helping to empower millions of people in rural parts of the world, there is no escape but to think about weaving. That, that is what started me. Um, now, the uh, handloom industry in India is in crisis, and these are various ways of describing it. I put a big red cross through it because I'm going to argue that this is a wrong picture. So th th I hope the red cross will prevent you to memorizing this, but I, I need this to show what I'm going to argue against. Um, for the livelihoods of these weavers, uh, they, they, they are more drawing on welfare systems than earning their own money. Uh, the technology is very old-fashioned, is static, is um, not adapted to current uh, times. Their products are only bought of charity, uh, but not because they have their own, their own uh, value. And basically the weaver is invisible, un unless in a big crisis. The conclusion of the government in India is, let's get rid of handloom as soon as possible. Now, there's a little bit of a problem in India uh, doing that, because Gandhi, in his independent, independence struggle, used the handloom, used handloom weaving and spinning as a symbol of independence against the, the British. So, you, you can't just get rid of uh, spinning and weaving in India because you would get rid of one of the most important symbols of the whole creation of your own state. So that means, well, let's put it in the museum then. Let's partly put them in welfare and partly put them in the museum, but clearly handloom is out and we can't, we can't do anything for these weavers. Weavers are very offended if they hear that. They say, well, I should have a footnote, and the footnote is that there are weaving communities that are quite poor, uh, but there are also weavers, like the one that I was now going to quote, who do very well, who can send their children to college, and who say, this isn't a picture that describes my practice. What I'm going to do is to try to analyze what they did. And it, I'm mostly drawing, and the name was in the previous picture, I'm mostly drawing on work that a PhD student uh, of mine did, Annapurna Mamedipudi, um, and it, it's her work that I will mostly be uh, describing. What I want to describe is how innovation happened by several of these weaving groups, and that through that innovation, they actually succeeded in, in having a stable livelihood, completely contradicting this picture. Because this, this, I mean, this standard image of handloom weaving says, it's out of date, it's static, nothing changes, uh, we have to give them welfare, uh, they can't take care of themselves. Now the rest of the story shows that this is wrong and I'm trying to analyze, to trying to understand how, how they actually do that. This picture is important. Um, the left one uh, is a picture from a piece of fabric that is currently in the Victoria and Albert Museum in um, Britain. It's an old piece of fabric from India, very exquisite, very beautiful. This is uh, a picture that is current, that is from, I mean, it was produced six years ago. And the question is, what historically, what happened? And, and if you would look more, ca and, and, and if, the, if, my, my, if the projection would have been a bit more precise, you would see the sort of digitized curve here. Very different from the very smooth and, and subtle curves in that left 200-year-old piece of fabric. When Annapurna, the researcher, saw this, saw this for the first time, she was offended. She was angry. She said, see, 
this is what computers do. When Western computers enter the weaving market, they ruin the, the, the beautiful art and craft that we have cherished for um, hundreds of years in India, and they, and they produce those strange jarred uh, curves, which in old days we could make so nice and smoothly. Uh, it is a very cherished tradition. On the left hand, you see the goddess uh, Saraswati, and, the, the, and she is, she's pictured in a sari. This is again uh, from the, the Victoria and Albert Museum in Britain, with little golden motives. These are very classic motives, motives with gold thread, but very beautifully shaped. So that is the tradition that this researcher, Annapurna, thought had been ruined by the introduction of the computer. What turned out, she, she visited, the, uh, she visited the, um, uh, the designer and the weaver, and the rest of the story is what she then found out. This, this is the technique they use to make those patterns. It's called Jamdani. Uh, the details don't matter now. What is important is that you uh, accept that, that it is it's very traditional, it's a very old uh, 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 style of uh, making, making patterns, making little flowers uh, on a fabric. Um, it's very high skilled, you, I mean you, 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 need a very, you need to be a very high skilled weaver to, to be able to do jamdani. And it is labor intensive, you see that this is done by hand. The big, the big uh, cloth is done on the loom, but then you, they, the, the weaver stops, and, and with hand picking the threads, they, he creates uh, that, that, little, that little flower. So it's traditional, it's highly labor intensive, um, and it is, um, it, and you need a lot of skill. Seemingly, all things that you would not think are part of a modernization process. In modernization, you would move forward, not to the traditional technologies, but to modern technologies. You would try to de-skill, because high-skilled labor is very expensive, and you would try to save on labor, rather than making it labor-intensive. So, Jamdani is the last thing that you would expect to be part of any innovation currently in um, weaving. Well, this is what happened. Um, a huge increase in cotton yarn price that left that, that, that posed a clear threat to the livelihood of uh, weavers, and they had to do something. Either they would go bankrupt and leave weaving altogether and go into the city and start uh, hammering stones, or they would they needed something. What they did is they shifted to Jamdani. And they shifted to digitization. They started to use the computer. Now that is very, as I argued in the previous slide, that is very counterintuitive. Because that Jamdani is more labor intensive, it's backward, and the digitization, that was the previous slide, the digitization makes the motive very ugly, very jarred, rather than beautifully smooth. So it seems to be a backward innovation in all terms. It is, yes, a backward innovation, but it did make them survive. It somehow produced a stable livelihood for them. I still haven't explained how, but this is what happened. The Jamdani weavers, the new Jamdani weavers, suddenly had a better income. They could provide for their family. They could send their children to college. The double, I've still not explained what a double riddle is. This is one, this is half of the riddle. The double riddle is that they don't want to call it innovation. Actually, they were offended when Annapurna and I called it innovation. They said, no, we cherish tradition. We make the kind of fabric that the goddess Saraswati wore and that our, our grandparents wore. So, no, we cherish tradition. We are not in the matter, because for them, innovation is associated with IT, with putting uh, labor out on the street, with mechanization. 
So here is something that provides for stable livelihoods that we call innovation because things changed in the technology and in the craft, but that they don't want to call innovation. Now, I'm now going to explain how the digitization plays a role in the whole story. Um, the first step in that analysis is not to talk only about that one artifact of the loom, the bicycle in my previous story. The next step is, and th that which, which Annapurna elaborated, is let's not just talk to that about that one artifact in isolation, but about a socio-technical ensemble, uh, a, a chain of different, uh, in this case, uh, relevant social groups. Um, I'm not going to explain all their roles, but you, 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 you recognize the yarn trader, you recognize the weaver down there, you recognize the designer, and all of them have their own technologies behind them. And Annapurna's point was, if you do not look only at that one technical thing, the loom, or the computer, or any of the one thing, but you look at that whole ensemble, I can explain how the digitization actually helped the weaver. And that is summarized in this table. You don't need to read the table. The point is that uh, all those rows uh, describe one particular step, a necessary step in the whole process of producing a, weft, uh, a, a fabric. The red and green arrows explain what the effect of computerization was. The red arrow is speeding up, making it more quickly, making it easier. The green one is slowing down. The computer resulted in speeding up, what is it, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 of these different activities, so that the weaver could actually slow down using his jamdani. And that slowing down of the jamdani was compensated by speeding up all the other elements, which I'm not going to explain in detail, but all the other elements were speeded up through, the, through use of the computer, and that allowed the use of jamdani in that whole ensemble still produce uh, all the relatively short notice uh, products and sell them at a marketable price. So, what I've described to you, we concluded, is an innovation. If you follow the rule that um, if it looks, walks, and quacks like a duck, it must be a duck. Well, this was changing the technology, improving the technology, learning a new skill, uh, f facilitating that ensemble, everything that would normally go into an innovation. So let's call it an innovation, even though the, the weavers didn't like it initially. They now do, but initially they were offended, as I, t as I said. So no one sees it as an innovation, not only the weavers, but also not the state, because they still think that handloom is moving backward. We think that having this new concept of innovation now uh, allows of sort of reinventing handloom uh, as an innovating tradition to show why these weaving communities actually are successful by this innovation that they do not want to call an innovation to create a more stable uh, livelihood. They actually transcend, and that is interesting for me as an STS researcher, they transcend the difference between the traditional and the modern. It doesn't make sense. They, they, they make the traditional and they are proud of the traditional, but they use what we typically call modern technologies like the, like the IV computer. So the whole distinction between modern and traditional doesn't work, falls apart. Um, there is an, an, a, a continuum between scientific knowledge and indigenous knowledge, local knowledge. I haven't talked about it, but their skills of uh, dyeing with natural dyes uh, requires a lot of local knowledge, indigenous knowledge, which is extremely sophisticated, uh, but can't be found uh, in textbooks. 
but it's an important part of the innovation in that weaving community. So in conclusion, they, they figured out a way of changing while maintaining the tradition. And that is something that when I talk to uh, colleagues who are more working in the arts, is something that in several traditions of the fine arts is also important, where it is important to hang on to your tradition, but it doesn't mean that there isn't development and there isn't innovation. So a broadening of innovating of technical machines, that's where I started with the bicycle, into more a changing of socio-technical ensembles allows to now apply that SCOT, that Social Construction of Technology Analysis, to a much wider set of spheres also beyond the technology narrowly. Conclusion of the, this first chapter. Uh, oh, 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 this one. Technology is socially constructed. It's even more than the, the technology. It is socio-technical. That's the point of that socio-technical ensemble. And the reconceptualization of handloom, let's now focus on the handloom, does explain how these weaving communities are able to sustain themselves. It opens up new and other possibilities uh, to keep weaving while the, the world is changing around you. And it does combine an understanding of technology and crafts and the fine arts within one framework, conceptual framework, or call it a theory for that matter. That is the conclusion of chapter one on technology. Now, I want to talk about science. And I'll tell you a story about, again, it's about India. Um, it's about biogas. And my point will be, I will make a plea for what I will call epistemological justice, but I'll explain later. This is the problem. Twice a year in October and in April, but mostly in October, uh, this is what you see in the, cities, uh, in the streets of Delhi. A lot of smoke, so much that the whole public life often comes to a grinding standstill. Traffic, but not only the traffic, you, I mean, it, it, it really uh, grips you by the throat, so also working becomes really difficult. Um, this is a picture from a satellite. These are the Himalayas. Pakistan is up there. This is India. Below the Himalayas is a big band of smoke, and all those red dots are uh, fires where farmers burn their rice straw uh, to get rid of the rice straw, that causes the smoke and that causes the, 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 the both the health problems and the public sort of public mobility problems uh, in Delhi and, and all over the north of India. Um, we were asked uh, by a chemical firm uh, to help them implement uh, an innovation that they had invented. They had invented an enzyme that would allow to turn that rice straw into biogas. And they argued that means that these farmers don't have to burn it. Uh, we make biogas and we sell the biogas back to the farmers, everyone happy. They realized it might be a bit difficult to just go there as a chemical firm. So they asked SDS people to join in that project and to study farming communities and their values and then use that to help the chemical firm to better design uh, the, the process of implementing that, that whole uh, fabrication of biogas. So we started uh, that project, we did a lot of field work amongst farmers, SSTS researchers, trying to understand how the world looks like for them. Um, and uh, the first thing that we found is that for them, that rice straw really is a problem. It's a problem to get rid of in a window of two weeks. They have to get rid of it in two weeks because after two weeks after the harvest of the rice, they have to sow wheat. And the only way they can get rid of that is either by using very expensive machines, which most of the farmers cannot afford, or by burning it. 
So for the majority of the farmers, burning rice straw is a solution. It's not at all a problem. No, said they said, the real problem are those people in Delhi who have those very smoky uh, traffic cars and they cause most of, yeah, of course, we, we also cause a bit of smoke. We know that and we don't like it. But we do that because the rest of India pushes us to do it. They want four crops a year. They want four, they, 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 these farmers have four crops a year. It's inconceivable in the Netherlands and I, would, I, 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 I suppose in Turkey too. But in order to do that, they have only these two weeks to get rid of the rice straw. So don't blame us, the farmers say. You want us, you push us to grow rice in the first place. They never grew rice. They don't eat rice there. They were pushed to grow rice during the Green Revolution 30, 30 years ago. They were pushed to do four cycles a year. So they are obliged to get rid of the straw in two weeks. And burning is a solution. It's not a problem. Moreover, they said, we have enough electricity, enough gas, so who cares? We don't want that biogas. We then realized the old trick of Scott, the social construction of technology. If you want to understand the technology, you look at the different relevant social groups. And you try to describe through the eyes of those relevant social groups how the world looks like, what is the technology, or what is the socio-technical ensemble. And we were kind of shaked awake by these farmers. We thought that we were part of a project that was going to tackle the problem of rice straw burning. And the first thing that we were told is that it isn't a problem but a solution. So we said, okay, let's do our homework a bit better. Let's look at these different relevant social groups. Now, the relevant social group of scientists Scientists see a very nice scientific problem. Um, they know that if you start with sugar, it's a very straightforward process to turn that into ethanol, into, into a biofuel. If you start with corn, they have a very clever enzyme that does it, and it ends up uh, in, uh, in biofuel. But things like rice, don't do that. There are question marks here. There are at least three question marks, which means that they don't have a solution here. The problem is that in rice stems is a lot of wooden material, uh, lignocellulose, and that is very difficult to break down, so they need very clever enzymes to break that down. They don't have that yet. Yeah, that chemical firm that hired me said they had one. They never showed it to me. And I'm, I'm not quite sure what its status is, because the story ends in a very different way. But for a scientist, basically, this was the challenge. It was a beautiful scientific problem. You could write articles about it. You probably could patent it at some point. A sweet problem. For policymakers, uh, it was the promise of turning waste into wealth. There, is, there are millions of tons of agricultural waste in a country like India. Well, in all countries, but definitely in a country like India. So when you would have a trick to turn all that waste, not only the rice straw, but also the other types of waste, into biogas or ethanol, biofuel, you would be getting sleepingly rich. So policymakers, for policymakers, the big promise is to turn all that waste into wealth. Industry said, okay, great, we are going to make money. If policymakers want that wealth, then we are going to do it for them. Our scientists will solve the scientific problem. Our problem is a logistical problem. Our problem is how to get that rice straw in those two weeks to our manufacturing plants in time and how to compensate the farmers for doing etc. etc. I'm not going into the details. But this again is a very, you see a very different picture if you look at it through the eyes of industry. Finally, and those will be the heroes of my story, a small group of farmers said, we don't want to burn it, but we also don't want to give it away to industry. It's crucial that we keep it and that we give it back, that rice store, that we give it back to the soil. There are too many nutrients too many valuable uh, elements in that rice straw which we want to give back to the soil. 
And that's what we want to do. And we have different ways of doing that. We organized one big farmers meeting, more than 100 farmers, about 100 farmers were present for a full day. And something very interesting happened there. Different, and, and it was a mixture of organic farmers, the farmers who said, we, want, we don't want to get rid of the rice straw, we want to give it back to the soil, but the majority were green revolution farmers, the ones who, the ones who, who were in that four, four, uh, four crop a year uh, cycle and who were burning. They started to tell each other tricks of solving the problem. And at some point, about after two or three hours, someone sat down after talking, and from the other side of the circle, someone stood up and said, hey, give me your mobile number. Meaning, I want to know more about that. I want to visit your farm. I want to learn what you more about what you just told me. That became a running gag. More and more, after someone had stood up and told a particular trick or a, or a, or a piece of practice, from the other side of the circle it was yelled, give me your mobile number. And it became a kind of a joke. But it was a very, a very sort of validating joke, but because the subtext of what happened was that they recognized that the others, that in that circle of hundred farmers, there was a lot of knowledge that they were not aware of before. That collectively they actually knew a lot, much more than they ever realized. So the effect of that one day meeting in the burning sun with 100 farmers was, by the end, they had completely forgotten about these researchers that came from Europe and Indian universities, asking them about biogas and asking them. No, what remained at the end of the day was that they had learned from each other various ways of tackling the problem. And they had a whole list of mobile numbers. And they were going to visit each other to, to explore ways of improving their own practice. My point here is that in this sort of modern way of doing uh, innovation, uh, the, the, the point is that you try to include as early as possible the users, the end users of what you are working for. So let's call that social inclusion. My point is it's not enough to have them at the table. It is also important to recognize that they have their own knowledge and that we need to cherish that knowledge and to value it and give it an, and give it a serious place at the table and that's what i call epistemic inclusion it's not enough to invite them at the table we should also think about a way of empowering them to know that they have that knowledge and to sort of feel powerful enough to tell that knowledge and to share it with the others that epistemological, that epistemological justice implies that it's not only a democratization of knowledge in the standard way that we tend to think about it in the Netherlands and in Turkey. Democratization then means that more people can go to the university, but it's only scientific knowledge that they are demo democratized in. No, this means that, that we try to democratize the validation of knowledge, the, 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 the decision what knowledge counts. Like in this farmers meeting, they started to realize that their knowledge counts. It was validated. It was not only the knowledge of the agricultural engineers who from the universities in India that visited the farmers. No, it was their own knowledge that was validated. The critique of knowledge also is democratized. They were, we then later organized workshop where we invited these farmers together with scientists and policymakers, and we made sure that they the, the, the farmers could speak and criticize policy making for what they did to them. And in India that means that you have to provide for, for translation, so there were at least four languages spoken in those workshops, and just having a special translator for those farmers in, the, in itself was a validating effect. They were there, invited into a university. They were given a translator. There was a, there was a, a, a European professor who gave them a, the floor, and all these Indian scientists were listening to them. That was an act of, well, epistemic justice. 
and it and it and it and it strengthened them, it empowered them, and it made them realize that they themselves have a lot of knowledge and can and can innovate. Last story, I'll be relatively quick there. Th this goes back to the Netherlands. Uh, it is about nanotechnology, and the question is, what to discuss about an emerging technology like nanotechnology? Who? who to ask whom to ask at the table, and when to do that. Let's start with the question, uh, when. This is the challenge that we were concretely faced with 10 years ago, like many societies in the world. How do you democratically take a decision about something that you don't know much about yet? Because nanotechnology was very new. Yes, there were promises, but there were also risks, but no one knew about it, so what do we do? This is the dilemma. Do you have an early policy making while you don't know much about the details? Or do you wait when you know much more? But if you wait, then maybe investments have gone so far that it's very difficult to change the course of events. So waiting may mean that you, yeah, you can make your, you, 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 you can list every, all the positive sides and all the negative sides, but it's too late to change the world. Here, you're in time to change the world and to formulate policies, but you still don't quite know what's going to happen. Now, in that dilemma, uh, the Dutch government decided to go, to opt for the early uh, solution and to have, uh, 10 years ago, uh, a societal dialogue on nanotechnology, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. I was vice chair of the, the committee that organized that. First question is, so this was the question, when? When do you do this? And, and in this case, it was decided by the Dutch government to do it early. The next question is, who? Whom is asked to participate in that democratic process, in that debate about policy making? Now, in order to answer that question, the government drew on this scheme. Uh, the scheme says there are three types of risks in society related to science and technology. The first on the left hand are known risks. Don't be mistaken, it will kill you, asbestos will kill you, radioactive radiation will kill you, but we know why you're dead. We know everything about it. The science is perfectly clear, so that is why it is a known risk. In that case, we argued, well, I, I, I was chair of the committee that advised the government about this, we argued, only ask scientists. There's no need to have anyone else. You, you, you paid a lot of taxpayers' money to train these scientists, it's their job. If they do a bad job, you can fire them afterwards, but this is a question that they should know. Known risks, we just give them to scientists, we ask them their advice, and we probably follow that advice. In, in this category of risks, that is not so easy. The example is from nanotechnology, is nanotoxicity. Nanotoxicity is the phenomenon that if you, for example, if you take gold. Gold, we all know, if you have golden jewelry, that will not, that will not re react with your skin. Uh, because it is inert, it doesn't chemically react with other elements, it's called inert. Every school child knows that. However, if you make smaller and smaller and smaller particles of that gold up to nano size, it suddenly turns highly toxic. There is scientific evidence for that, so it's not just s scaring people, it's True, scientists say this is happening, but they don't quite understand. And they don't, want, they don't know how to, how to fight against it. Like asbestos, you have, you have screens and you try to get rid of it in your, in your houses, and uh, radioactive radiation, you have screens. Uh, in this case, they didn't know what to do about it. So, in that case, for example, the question, there are these nano drug delivery things, so a nano trick that brings the chemotherapy directly to your tumor and not to the rest of your body. Beautiful. All the side effects of a chemotherapy you would not have because the chemo directly attacks the tumor. That's a great benefit. But the risk 
is also there. That is that nanotoxicity. But the scientists say, hey, hang on. Don't ask us to decide because we don't fully understand the science of it. So our point is there, you need stakeholders. You need, in this case, in, in the case of my example, you need the patients who have a cancer, the oncologists, the health insurance uh, firms, the ones who have a stake, the ones who have an interest. Because scientific arguments can't decide, cannot decide, so bringing in the interests and weighing the interests is an must be an inevitable part of taking a decision in the case of uncertain risks. Get stakeholders on board. And for every case, it will be a different set of stakeholders, of course. Now, here, it is even more problematic. In this case, at least we, will all, we all agree that we, didn't, we don't want tox toxic materials. We don't want people to die from, from, from chemo. We want the chemo to help. So the basic values, everyone agrees on. This is the example where even the basic values are in disagreement. An example is uh, what is called human enhancement. A concrete example is a memory chip in your brain. A memory chip would enhance your memory. I would love it. Um, but other people would say, ah, that's the last thing that you can do. It is tinkering with God's creation. It's playing God. You shouldn't, you shouldn't engineer human bodies. So at that very fundamental level of where do we want our society to move? Do we allow human enhancement? Or is that, is that a bridge that we never ever want to cross? That is so fundamental a question that we said, then ah, I should, that what is below here are citizens. So you still need the scientists, you need the stakeholders because there are lots of interests and stakes, but now there is no escape to also involve citizens because this is about society. It's about the setup of the direction in which the whole society will move. So for ambiguous risks, you need to also involve science, uh, citizens. And on our conclusion was that in the case of nanotechnology, you're roughly talking about that set of problems. So we said to the government, no escape, you really have to somehow figure out a way of involving and the citizens and stakeholders and scientists. Now that resulted in uh, this societal dialogue. Three years, it costed four million euros. Uh, there was an independent uh, committee to organize that, not part of the government, but they had put it at arm's length of the government. Um, and, and we did indeed reach a very wide participation of the Dutch population. Now, I'll skip all the details. Uh, this is the result. We measured before and after the dialogue in the Dutch general population what they knew about nanotechnology and how they thought about nanotechnology. And the result is, first, there was indeed an increase in understanding of nanotechnology in knowing what it was, including the benefits of it. It was small a small increase, but it was statistically significant, so there was a real increase. Secondly, there was also an increase in recognizing that there were risks, that it was not just a, a hallelujah, everything will be beautiful in the future kind of story. No, it comes with a price. And finally, and for me as an STS researcher most rewarding, generally citizens also said, yes, continue with doing nanotechnology research, but we want you, and there are direct quotes from various parts of the dialogue, we want you scientists to pay as much attention to the risks as you pay to developing the nanotechnology and to the benefits. But if you do, then please continue because we understand that there are lots of benefits, but we now also understand the risks. We want to move forward, but we want to move forward in a balanced way. Building blocks for the democratic system. If I look back to what we did in the Netherlands, then I would say these are building blocks of, uh, of that democratic governance. There is technology assessment that did uh, much of that organizing work of the dialogue. 
Scientific advice played an important role in the whole story. Civil society organizations were important, not, not, not just universities, not universities or, or ministries. Civil society organizations stood up for certain groups in society, took up the role of stakeholders for particular bits and pieces. I mean, and that ranged from fundamentalist Christian women organizations uh, to uh, labor unions. I also think we need the capacity to develop a thinking about both science and technology, but also political normative ethical issues, and that is broader than teaching, broader than universities. In my view, something like Istanbul Lab is very much an example of that kind of capacity building. We need something like regulatory institutions, because by the end of the day, there must be regulations formulated that then will be implemented to keep industry or, indus uh, or, or university between certain, between certain uh, conditions. And finally, you need a free press and you need free media. That's not a cheap remark. As a vice chair of that dialogue, I was rather annoyed that we didn't get the kind of press that I thought we deserved. We didn't get much negative press, but we didn't get much press at all. And I was, and I would have liked to have a better grip on the press, but I quickly realized that that is not something that I should wish, um, and that it just has to sail its own course. So it, it, it's, not, it's not a cheap addition at the bottom of the slide. I think it's crucial also for this type of democratic process. Conclusion of this chapter, and that is, that this is actually the last slide. I think that for democratizing technological cultures, it is specifically necessary to combine expert advice with public participation, but it's not only necessary, it's also possible. One lesson from this nano dialogue is that it is actually possible to have scientists and citizens talk to each other just as much as in the previous story, the scientists and the farmers were able to talk to each other. It is important to create a governance process that it's much more pluriform and hybrid and complicated than a simple-minded parliament, government, uh, and some maybe some advice body. This, this is the, the problems of our techno technological culture are much too complicated for simple schemes like that. And finally, and this is also drawn on a previous story, it's not enough to ask everyone at the table. There must be a conscious effort to strengthen and to empower subordinate marginal positions and people. If you don't do that, you're cheating. You invite them at the table, but they will be so intimidated by all those scientists and university people that they, that they don't dare to speak, speak up. And, and, and you, 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 you didn't actually invite them. So in addition to inviting them, you also need to figure out ways, and you, I mean we as democratic societies, need to figure out mechanisms to empower the marginal, the, uh, the disadvantaged, the, uh, the powerless. Finally, what I hope I have done is that um, Th this was partly a, a, a story very broadly about democracy. But I'm not a political scientist. I'm just a simple engineer, and I'm an SES person, and I studied science, technology, and society. So what I did is did a, a bit like the trick with the bicycle. I zoomed in on science and technology, issues about science and technology, rethinking the technology, rethinking the science, then the rethink the dem the rethinking the democratic process that I was part of around nanotechnology. But I hope that I made clear that through that example of science, through of science and technology, we actually get a vision of a much broader possibility and, and, and a kind of invitation to democratize our current societies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wiebe. Your examples were really excellent, very, very interesting. Um, I will have a couple of questions for you. Uh, I'm hoping that we can manage to get your answers to them for in 20 minutes, and then we will have 20 minutes for the floor to uh, ask questions, okay? Uh, my first question is, you 
ask yourself uh, the one of your works, you say that what about the expertise needed uh, by other relevant social groups to, in order to be able to engage in political debates about science and technology? In other words, isn't it the development of technology, scientists, and engineers' job? That is, of course, the standard image of science and technology. We all know it's the common kind of sense. Uh, therefore, it is very difficult to convince uh, many people uh, that as one of the relevant social groups, uh, citizens' participation uh, in the process of uh, democratic control of technology uh, can work. It is very difficult to convince the people, uh, I assume. So it's not only uh, difficult because of lack of expertise on the subject, but it is also difficult politically uh, in the countries where there is not much of a democratic climate, like Turkey, right? Uh, well, th when this is the situation, can existing technologies like internet uh, help to uh, enhance democracy in these countries? This is my first question. Um, I think you actually asked three questions. Uh, uh, the last one is how can technology help democracy? Uh, the one before that is how, um, uh, or I'll make it into two. How can, how can citizens participate in technology while they don't know anything about it? Um, oh, and no, no and, and the third one that I heard, but these are my words, is um, why would anyone want to listen to these citizens? How, 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 why is participation acceptable? Um, let, let, let me start with that last one. Um, one, of the <laughs> one of my nicest experiences was in that, I, I didn't talk about it, but it was at the background, that when I chaired the committee on nanotechnology that advised the government to do a societal dialogue, I was the only STS person on that committee. I chaired it, but the rest were nano scientists. And in the first meeting, they were a bit suspicious of me. Everyone knew that I had no clue about nanotechnology. Why did, why did, they, uh, why did the boss ask me to chair that? Very quickly, when we come, came with this scheme, they were relieved, these nanoscientists. They were suddenly relieved and they realized that with this scheme, they, as scientists, would no longer be accused of making a mess. The scheme explained that they couldn't be charged with the, with the decision uh, because there is scientific uncertainty about nanotechnology. So they were actually relieved that we came up with an advice to the government to, to include participation. And I think for the government that was similar. They, the, the, the government in the Netherlands realized that there were previous cases, for example, uh, um, around genetic modification, where it had gone terribly wrong. Wrong in the sense that they kept out participation of others than scientists up to the point that, the, the, that, that basically there was a shutdown uh, required by the, uh, uh, by the Dutch population and there was no biotechnology possible. And this has been a big trauma for both government and industry and the science. And they realized that they, they wanted to avoid that. And this scheme where, where for certain questions you would invite stakeholders and, and citizens, but not for everything, we're not going to vote whether two plus two is four, that is for the mathematicians. So there is an area that we don't meddle with. It's for the scientists. But there is also an area where scientists and engineers are actually happy that they are lift, that the burden is lifted from their shoulders, that they have to know everything. It's recognized that they don't know everything. Now the question how internet can help uh, democracy is, is a very different one. It's in a way it's turning the whole question around. Um, and I, I, don't, I, don't have, I, I, I don't have a quick answer, the, except that I think, um, I mean, we almost every day now read examples of, in a way, the bicycle story. The bi my bicycle story showed you, hopefully, that, uh, that, that hidden in that bicycle is an unsafe machine and is a macho machine. So 
if you do the analysis carefully enough, uh, it, the technology opens up and you see other identities of that technology. My understanding of uh, news reports only yesterday in the D Dutch newspapers about the recent Russian uh, elections, the local municipal elections, regional elections in Russia, where the, the ruling party of Putin still won. The accusation is that they only could win marginally with something like 55% by, by, by some cheating in the end but that, that the opposition actually got so far as some 40% is because of a very inventive use of social media, which no one had thought about before, but, and, and you have to reread, -re I, can't, I can't explain the details at this moment, but there was a new way of using social media to, to, to instruct people just before getting into the, into the booth whom to vote. And by that collective sort of steering of voting, they could steer, uh, they, they, they could push up certain candidates so that they won uh, uh, of uh, candidates of the government, uh, the oh, ruling party. And, and, and that was summarized by the title of smart, but that's a, a word. I mean, I still can't explain what smart vote is, but you're right, that's it, yes. But it, I, I, I mentioned that example because it's an example that, that shows that, th yes, internet can be used to democratize, but it is in a way that at least I hadn't thought of before yesterday, uh, and that, n as far as I know, no one, nowhere else has been practiced so far. So my plea would be try to use a kind of SCS analysis to study different bits and pieces of internet and digital technology, and try try to be innovative and try to be creative, and then. And then, yeah, maybe things are possible that we don't think are now possible, and, and surely I, I wouldn't know. But So I don't give a big, grand answer, because I don't think that they work very well. I mean, we all know examples where internet was very counter-democratic. We all know the stories about the United States and Facebook and Google and all that. We know those stories. The story of Russia of last week shows that there is a different way. So there's not only the unsafe bicycle, there is the macho bicycle too, or vice versa, whichever you prefer. <laughs> OK, thank you. Uh, my other question is, again, about the argument of expertise uh, needed in the development stage of technology, according to the um, standard view of science and technology. You say that. Um, there's a clear distinction between the contents of science and technology and their application. About applications, other social groups of citizens and politicians can debate. So you imply, actually, that uh, technology can be democratized during the application phase. Uh, as being a labor process person myself, I have doubts about uh, how successful it can be during the application phase, especially when I'm, when I'm thinking about, um, about the application process of uh, Taylor's technologies or Henry Ford's assembly line technology. Uh, as we all know, they are shaped by capitalist class structure, and they produce the um, a, a capitalist production relation to these technologies. So how can we really democratize these technologies in the application process? So I, I think it is more important to find the ways to intervene or participate in the development stage of technology, uh, science and technology actually. Well, I, I couldn't agree more. I agree. And I'm very happy that you asked this so that I can explain myself better. I do not want to argue that you can only change technology in its application phase. I think that it is at least as important and possible to, to shape it and, 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 and democratize it in, in its earliest phase. And, and the example of, uh, well, in a way, the example of nanotechnology is about that because there were no applications, there were dreams of application, but there were no applications yet. And in a way, the farmers, the farmers debate too. I mean, it was the, um, uh, well, actually all three stories, because also the handloom weavers, it was actually in their own process 
uh, where, where the innovation happened. So um, I would say, yes, it, it can and it should happen in very early phases. The point that I did make, and you were right there, is that I, I would object to the argument, and once the technology is there, it's too late. No, because that bicycle was already out in the market, uh, people were using it, and, and then it changed its identity. Then it became, uh, from a macho bike, it became an, an unsafe bike, and that started the whole process of, of lowering the wheels, etc. So my argument is a social construction of technology analysis allows us to also intervene in later processes. But my advice would be start as early as possible. But don't give up if, if, you, if you enter a stage and there is already something. Uh, but, but yeah, no, I definitely would try to start earlier. Okay, my last question. Um, it is very exciting to see this cut approach uh, is being applied more and more in very different uh, issues like uh, development and uh, colonization, uh, the role of innovation in uh, public health, etc. Uh, also, it is very exciting to see that new topics are uh, taken up globally in, in, in new geographies uh, like India. Uh, can you comment on these developments, uh, especially in relation to the future of SDS? Yeah, I think that there is no, there's no denying that SDS has been, say, in its in the first first 25 years of its existence, a very Western business, uh, for all sorts of reasons, most of them quite trivial. Um, but it did have effects. It, there was a very strong bias, which most of us didn't even realize, uh, a, 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 a kind of a Western, Northern, rich country type of bias. That, has, that is now quite radically changing. Um, it's not accidental that two, of my, that two of my three stories are from India. And I, I find it extremely enriching to, to, well, to work with Indian colleagues. In, in all these cases, it wasn't me, the European, going there. It was collaboration with Indian uh, SDS researchers. Um, I think that I have learned to see certain things in India that, for example, cognitive justice and the whole issue of what I called epistemological inclusion that were visible in India because, because the way that that society is structured and, and, there, are, and there are much wider divides than, than in my Dutch society. But after I recognize them in India, I see them at home. So um, I learn things from my Indian colleagues and from research in India that, yes, I learned them in India, but they are very applicable in, in, in the Western side of, and in that sense, if you now, I mean, looking more at, S, at, at academic SDS, uh, in a 4S meeting, that, that big uh, global conference that was held this time uh, in New Orleans uh, three days ago, you see a huge number from, say, the global south, uh, the global east participating, um, and you really see a change in agenda and a new set of concepts that say, the old guys, the, 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 the white male old guys, couldn't have thought of themselves, but are very happy to learn from them. Thank you very much. Uh, these are my questions. Okay. Uh, floor is yours, people. Any questions to ask Vibe? Yes. Yeah, 
Yeah, um, I, I have two answers, but basically I'm afraid I have to agree with you. Um, I, have, I, I have a small positive uh, report to make and a big negative report, which supports your skepticism. The small positive report is the starting of my biogas project. I was approached by the industry. That chemical industry realized, they, they, I had done work with them on nanotechnology previously, so he knew a little bit about STS. The, I mean, the, 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 the head of research uh, that who, who approached me. He realized that, that, that they wouldn't be able as company to just roll out their innovation. They needed to better understand society in order to do that. He knew that and he came to me and he, and he asked to, 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 to have a joint project with SDS people, with social scientists in order to, to, to develop his innovation. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah no, you can be cynical about it, but, but still he wanted, he wanted to come and I agree and I, and I, and I shamelessly uh, exploit that kind of risk anxiety. I mean, uh, uh, to be honest, I mean, I, I still haven't told you the, the big negative reaction, but, but just as a footnote to this, I shamelessly reminded the nanotechnologists of what happened with uh, genetic modification. And they realized, that, oh, that's not what we want to happen to nanotechnology. Oh, no, let's, 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 let's listen a little bit more to these social scientists and these SDS people, how we can avoid the pitfall that all our colleagues in biotechnology fell in 10 years before. I shamelessly exploit that, that, that fear, but to no avail. So now m my second report, which basically supports your skepticism, and, and in that sense I can't be very optimistic and I'm not naive. During that biogas process, it remained quite difficult to really get our fingers behind the knowledge that the chemical firm had. Um, that is also why, I mean, you, you may have missed it, but in a very small sentence I said, and I actually still don't know whether they have the enzyme. They claimed they had the enzyme because that was the starting of the project. But I've never seen it. I've never seen it work. And it was very difficult to get access to those laboratories. At some point, I didn't care because I wasn't interested in developing that technology of them. I was interested in that farmer's knowledge and I became interested in a very different problem to, to, to help the farmers reframe the problem of, uh, of the burning of rice straw and help farmers to, to get themselves out of that position where they are criminalized by the Indian state and, 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 and journalists for, for setting fire. So it became a different project. But all along, I haven't got my fingers behind the R&D doors of the firm. So yeah, no, you're quite right in being skeptical. The reason that I'm still continue is that, is that first point. Industry knows that if, they, if, if somehow they can't get access to either a proper regulation or a consumer market, they can forget it. And my argument to them will always be, well, it's, it's the basic argument of technological culture. Hey guys, you live in a world that is too complicated for you to understand if only your chemistry and your pharmaceutical knowledge and your physics knowledge. You really need to think broader. And if you don't want to, fine, we'll see each other 10 years from now, but my prediction is you'll fail. And we see what happens, I don't know. But I still believe that's quite true, and, 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 and an increasing number of them think so. And, there is, and, and most of the projects now carried out in, in uh, technical innovation involving firms in the Netherlands also involve social scientists. And of course, then we can be cynical that we are only used as excuse ladies or providing a lubricant to push the innovation well, through society. Yeah, exactly. But then, then the burden is on us. Let, let us take, use that opportunity and grab the opportunity and, and, and make more of it than only being that subservient person. But this is, I mean, I'm basically agreeing with you, but the rest of my uh, reaction was a statement of 
optimism rather than a diagnosis. Let's put it like that. Okay. Um, again, I agree with you, and I don't have an easy solution. This is an example where I would say, looking sort of from a distance at what happened in the world over the past 20 years, where clearly things went wrong, in the sense that, I mean, it, it's really a different story with nanotechnology, with synthetic biology, with uh, quantum, uh, quantum physics and quantum computers. There is, a much, there is much more awareness also among natural scientists that they should not make the mistakes of biotechnology. But biotechnology and genetic modification, in a way, we're too late. And by now, the investments of the Monsantos of this world are so huge that it is really, I mean, and that's the point that Hacher made before, but then with the example of Taylorism, the investments are so large that it is really very difficult to break it open. So in my work in India, I collaborate with activists who basically block and protest and burn test fields of Monsanto. So it is, it's, it is, it's, it's trying to block. It's not a process of democratic discussion anymore. And, um, and um, I, don't, I, I just don't know what to do about it, except the blocking. But the blocking is not what I'm trying, what I tried about, what I tried to talk about was a form of, of democratic technology and society development where, where everyone would participate and where, and where uh, it, there would not be a divide between the scientists and the social scientists or between the experts and the citizens. No, but that everyone would recognize the, the expertise that the others have and the, and the crucial role that also others have to play in that process. It's, it seems too late in the case of biotechnology. Everyone is in its own ditches and just shooting shooting to the other side and and i'm i'm really i'm a, i'm a bit i'm a bit somber i don't know what to do about it Question? so basically agreeing with you
again, I completely agree. I think, and I, I couldn't pack even more in this talk, but otherwise, uh, Sheila Jasanov's plea to think about more humility in our developing of science and technology uh, would certainly have fitted there. It actually, it actually f was part of the story, but I didn't mention it in the in the, the the further work that we did with the handloom. Um, we we after the dissertation we had uh, now two workshops, one one workshop and a very big conference where at some point the argument became, amongst uh, mo mostly, mostly weavers and craftspeople, where the uh, argument became, maybe we should rethink the all of industrialization in terms of craft, rather than in terms of mechanization and mass production. I mean, think of this world where, I mean, I, the, 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 the numbers are mind-boggling, and I tend to forget them, but where 2% of the people in this world own 90% of the resources, something like that, and all the, all the divides that we have globally, um, I think, and that's what we argued at the end of these crafts conferences, uh, there is no way that we can see the current style of hubris, science and technology, changing this. We only see a further widening of these divides. So maybe we should use the kind of analysis that we have given of handloom and are now trying to apply to other crafts, use that in a much more radical way to rethink the core of our style of doing science and technology. I completely agree. But that again, that needs a lot more work and, and, and I have o o only started to scratch the surface of that. But I'm very happy that you brought it up. They know each other increasingly well. I, there at this very moment, uh, that is here in Istanbul, is an SDS conference. And two days ago, I saw student projects where they used um, they did they didn't they didn't write a paper, but they made an an an, an, an artistic object. Uh, there were four of them uh, to express a point that they wanted to make at the end of their course. And that was a very, and well, admitted, some of them had, had a previous training in their bachelor as designer, so they came better prepared than, than someone like me. Uh, but it was an extremely convincing way of making an argument, convincing to me. And that was not the first example that I saw. In the case of, I mean, again, that was too much to talk about, but in the case of, uh, I can say a little bit more about it. In the case of handloom, at the moment that Annapurna was confronted with these weavers who were offended by her calling their changes innovation, they refused to talk to her anymore. Well, that's a problem for a PhD student because you want your empirical material. She made an extremely important change in the whole setup of the project at that moment. She decided Okay, let me turn to the artists, and then more particularly, let me turn to classical musicians. She did that because she herself is an amateur singer, but a quite well accomplished Indian classical music singer, and at some point she had used the word innovation to her teacher, to her guru. And she was almost thrown out of the house. Again, for the same reason. I cherish the tradition, the, the composers of 100 years ago, etc., etc., is exactly the same reaction that the weavers gave. But then there is a difference between these musicians who are, most of them are academically trained, they, they, they do a lot of writing, a lot of explicit reflection, so Anapuna figured, well, I was thrown out of the house, but I may knock on the door and try to get in, and then if I get them, these musicians, to talk about their I won't call it innovation anymore, but maybe I'm a, I'm, I may call it creation, crea sorry, creativity, 
she was allowed to call it creativity. Then the, disc then the, 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 the discussion continued. Maybe I can then better understand the process of innovation, uh, excuse me, a, a creativity in the arts and use those insights to bring it back to the weavers and then try to understand the weaving process. So a whole chapter in her dissertation is about creativity, innovation, in the arts, in this initially in the musicians, but in the workshops then also the, the, the pictorial arts. Uh, were brought in, and, 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 and we have artists participating and talking about their work. Um, and, and from there, she, well, in a way, developed a theory of creativity, or a theory of innovation, that then she could apply uh, in the case of, uh, well, technology, weaving. So it's a very concrete example where I think the, 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 the traveling to the arts and the returning to the technology was extremely beneficial. So I would be very much in favor of doing this much more often. But you are right that it isn't happen, happening very often. But uh, I, don't th I don't see any principal reason why we shouldn't do it more often. Yeah, s things happen. I mean, there are historical reasons why certain people don't talk to each other. Uh, but there doesn't need to be a principal reason why they can't benefit each other. And I think, I mean, I, well, I, I could have said much more about the arts, but this little bit was hidden in the, in the story about Hans Doom. Well, okay then. Thank you very much for your uh, participation, and thank you again for uh, Rebe. <laughs>